The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. Thanks a lot for inviting me. This is great. Um, one of the things that, uh, of course, we like to do at the museum is is get the word out. We're not just this this place where where uh, artifacts go and nobody ever sees them again. So we we uh, really want to uh, step up our outreach program, and this is a great opportunity to really come out and and talk about some of the things that we're doing. Uh, this so my. Um, my presentation here, it's, this is a little bit uh, misleading. It says slavery and freedom in the 19th century, water of elite. Did I say that right? Water of elite. Water of elite. So, um, but I'm also going to be talking about a site down in Bethlehem. Uh, so it's an overall talk about the, the project that we're, we're doing um, uh, related to uh, slavery on the Hudson River. I'm going to be walking around a bit because I don't have a uh, slide advance, so bear with me. Okay, so slavery in New York, it has a long history for those of you that don't know. Uh, about 200 years from the 1620s uh, uh, till emancipation in the 18, tw late 1820s. So um, part of what, um, when I first came here, as you, you heard, I came in 2014, and one of the things that I wanted to do, I, there's a lot of work that can still be done in terms of archaeology and under the understanding of slavery as it may represent itself in archaeology. So, um, so we started a program um, at the museum to try to look at some of the sites that, uh, um, that were involved in the slave trade. So larger, uh, larger estates that may have had five to ten slaves. Um, and just to see what, what kind of... Uh, uh, what well, we can understand about the conditions of slavery from uh, the archaeological record. The, uh, so one of the things I put in here, I just put in this just in the last minute here, I put this slide in because people were asking about, I have some artifacts up front here and I have some cowrie shells. And so I wanted to, to just briefly uh, talk a little bit about the Atlantic slave trade uh, during the uh, 17th and 18th century and its impact on New York. And so if you just look at like where are people, uh, enslaved people coming from, this gives you, whoops, this gives you a good idea. So you've got, uh, this is the, this is the uh, transatlantic uh, world here. Um, in the, excuse me, really in the late 17th century, mid, mid uh, 17th century to uh, late 17th century, there was a, a trade, a legal trade from Madagascar uh, these are just some of the numbers, and the numbers you see here, 1,200 slaves, that's based on a, there's a um, database out there called the Transatlantic Slave Database, and it's got, it's a compendium of all the, uh, the voyages uh, and the numbers of, of enslaved people that were brought over, and in some cases where they were from. So early on, uh, the Dutch were trading, um, in the late, late, eight, late 17th century, um, uh, you see a trade from Madagascar, um, there was also, for some reason there's, this is not in here, but early on, oh here we go. So early on the Dutch were trading, uh, the first place they were trading was in Central uh, Africa, so Angola, um, that area of, of Africa on the uh, coast. And then of course you see Madagascar, then later on the Gold Coast becomes important, and this follows the general trends in, in uh, 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 slavery. And then Senegambia, um, Sierra Leone, and then you know about half the number uh, of slaves or the voyages that end up in New York. We don't know where where these people were coming from, other than uh, the continent of Africa. So uh, there were a lot of slaves coming up from the Caribbean as well. Um, but this just gives you a good an, an idea of of uh, sort of the nature of of that trade and where people are coming from. Uh, in New York itself, this is a, a slide I've showed a couple times. Uh, this is just a, a general you know, population uh, figures for the number of enslaved people. Um, and of course, these are people mostly of African descent, but also Native American descent as well. Um, these are numbers from the 1680s through uh, 1790, and then 
After 1799, when the uh, Gradual Emancipation Act is passed, then you see, you know, um, uh, uh, people being emancipated and so on. So, at 1790, there were over 21,000 uh, enslaved people in New York State, and a lot of them in Albany County. Uh, if you look at it in another way, even though the, the overall population of enslaved people was going up, you see, you start to see a decrease in terms of the overall population because there were so many people coming into uh, New York after the 1750s. So th in this case, what you see here is on, on the right hand, you see the, the uh, Maryland versus New York. So Maryland is a classic uh, southern slave colony. I worked down there for about 20 years, 25 years, so. Um, I did some work in that area. So what you really see, you see uh, like in the 1730s, you see this big spike in terms of the overall percentage of population in Maryland, but then the percentage of population in New York falls. Okay, does everybody under understand that? Okay, um, so that's just a general overview. The, the types of questions that we're interested in, of course, when you do archeological work, you're interested in answering questions, right? It's just like, if you, write a, you don't write a history book just to write about the history, you usually have some sort of questions that you want to address. So one of the things that we are interested, there are two things I want to talk about today. The one thing was uh, just basically, what, how does the physical landscape of the states that had larger slave populations, so if there was, in New York, it, there's often, the situation of slavery in New York is often one or two slaves per household. Uh, but then there are larger, um, larger populations of slaves living on, on these estates. And in that case, maybe it's, it becomes um, a point where you can see it on the landscape. Okay, you can see uh, this, um, uh, this slave regime uh, showing, showing up on the landscape. So that was the first thing we wanted to do. So how does this, how does the physical landscape change before and after emancipation? You know, in terms of where buildings, what buildings are built, what how the landscape is maintained and so on. The second thing um, is to understand, well, what happens to the people who, who were enslaved and once they become emancipated, what happens? There's, do communities form and so on? So that's what we're trying to, to follow. And you know, we can follow that through history, uh, through historical records, and then begin to understand it through archeology span once we understand where people are moving. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about those two things. Um, the three sites that we've been working on so far are Schuyler Flats that most of you prob probably know about. It's in Colony. Um, and uh, Van Skyke, which is in Cohoes, and uh, the Nichols Sill House, which is down in Bethlehem. So I'm going to talk about the work that we've done at the Flats, uh, Nichols Sill, and then uh, I'll end up with Van Skyke if I have time. Okay, so Schuyler Flats. Uh, this what you see on the top here, and, and most people, most of you are probably familiar with the park. So you've got the Schuyler Flats Park, um, which you see up, up on the left-hand side. That's about 31 or 32 acres, uh, which is, is now all owned by the town. Correct, Kevin? Yes. Yeah, so it used to be partially owned by the town and then uh, a program, uh, not program, open space, the Open Space Institute. Uh, but now it's, it's solely owned by the, uh, the town and protected. Um, you can see on the, on the right hand side, there's a picture of the flats, um, the Schuyler house before it was burned down in the 1960s. And then a drawing at the bottom of what it may have looked like, that's Len Tantillo's uh, conjecture, conjectural drawing of the flats based on the work that Paul Huey did in the 1970s. So it's got a long history. It was, a, it was an important Dutch farm. Uh, it was an important uh, um, agricultural farm. And uh, all the way from the 1640s through the, um, really through the 20th century. So there's a broad history and there's also a prehistory of this site as you'll see in a, in a minute. So in terms of slavery, this, these are some of the slave names. This is uh, based on some research that uh, Lisa Anderson, she's our um, uh, curator of bioarchaeology at the at the museum. This is some of these are some of the names that that she and some of the figures that she came up with when she was doing work on the uh, African burial uh, ground project. And see, the problem here is these are just first names. Uh, um, it gives you some idea of the numbers of people living there, but 
What I really want to get to is after emancipation, where do these folks go? What is their, you know, where does Caesar, for example, what, where does he go? Um, where is his family moving and so on? One of the problems we have with slavery, um, other than just the, the sheer numbers, is the fact that um, in New York, oftentimes, and this is part of the narrative, oftentimes slaves lived in, uh, enslaved people were in cellars or in maybe outbuildings and so on. It's not like in, in Maryland or the South where you have this series of slave uh, um, quarters out on the plantation. So um, how do you see that archaeologically? Well, in the case of Schuyler Flats, there is some evidence um, from Anne Grant's memoir that there were outer, outer kitchens that uh, enslaved people lived in during the summer months. So I would just consider those quarters. I mean, that's what you would consider them in the South. Um, so if you see at the top, there's the, the description of uh, people living in these outer quarters. So on the left is, a, is the, uh, the building, uh, the, the house at the flats, as it looked in the, I believe that's early 20th century. I'm not sure what that picture dates to. But then you can see on the bottom, this is from the 1940s. This is in the center of the... Um, so this series of buildings that you see right there, and you can see, uh, sorry, I don't have a pointer, but so this building, there's obviously a house here. Um, so the, the, the Hudson River would be back this way. This is looking toward uh, uh, Broad. And uh, so this is obviously a dwelling. This also has a chimney. So this is some sort of kitchen addition and then some farm buildings. So our question with those were, was, uh, were those buildings there during slave, I mean, are these buildings that were really dur there during the early 19th century, or, or, um, uh, or not? So maybe there was a maybe there was a quarter out there. I'll show you, kind of where these buildings are. So all these buildings would have been. So if you look at this, you can see that this was called the Little River right here. So there's 787. So the house is like right up there, and these buildings would have been right out in here. So right out in the middle of the the parkland right now. Okay, and that's an area we haven't surveyed. So, okay, so some previous archaeology. So Paul Huey, this is a this is a young young Paul younger Paul Huey, um, <coughs> and uh, one of his colleagues out at the flats um, in the 1970s. So they were going to build. Uh, um, for those of you that don't know the story, the way that this thing got, and there were several individuals, and uh, uh, Kevin can can tell me who those individuals were that were responsible for this, this park actually becoming what it is today. But Paul was one of these people. So they were going to build a, um, they were going to build a steakhouse, I believe, right? A steakhouse. And uh, um, so Paul said, no, this is an important site. So they, he went down um, with, I believe, the Heldeberg workshop. Is that correct on this one? Yeah. And, uh, and they did this large dig to show, well, here we have this great resource. They found uh, um, a uh, mid-1640s cellar hole. It's is probably related to Aaron Van Curler's house. Um, they also found, and, and a little bit, so that area was preserved. And then in a later dig, they also found um, remnants of the, uh, or evidence of the earlier house that was uh, earlier um, portions of the uh, 18th or late 17th century house. So this is this shows you where um, the red. You see the red spot there. That's where Paul found the uh, the 1640s house. And then the um, uh, so the purple areas are the areas that, that uh, Paul and his and his group dug. And at the top of the the um, the screen is where uh, he found evidence of the building, uh, the transformation of this late 17th century building. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> So oh yeah, this will help. Um, so and the good thing now is Paul's actually writing this material up. So we'll have we'll have a really detailed uh, idea of what's going on here. So we wanted to cut. We wanted to complement what Paul's doing now, and then try to add to try to create more of a comprehensive idea about what's going on here, which is really uh, exciting. So uh, one of the things what I wanted to mention here. Okay, so this is one. Um, this would be uh, the area right about in here, right, right in this area. Um, Paul found this nice 
uh, uh, articulated uh, surface, uh, sort of a patio surface, I guess. And you can kind of see some, some lines in here. It's really uh, well uh, constructed. It's not just a bunch of, of cobbles they put down. They put them in a pattern. And you can see this on the other side. These are actually two different sites. This is, this is um, a special volume in uh, Northeast Historical Archaeology um, on a site out on um, Shelter Island, out in Long Island. Same time period, but it's almost identical to what they found here at the Schuyler House. So this is probably, um, I don't know, what, what do you think this dates to, Paul? 1780s. So this is very similar, but it's almost identical. Um, and, uh, but uh, what, I, what I want to point out here, and some of this might change, I guess, as Paul does his research, but uh, what's important about this in terms of the way that, that it was excavated was that um, when you excavate carefully, you want to you want to understand the relationship between things. So you have a layer here, you know it's from the 16, or you know it's from the 1780s, you have a layer below it, 1740s, and so on. So you want to you want to keep those soils together and you want to understand how the different parts of the architecture are related. Does that make sense to everyone? That's why you dig carefully. That's why you record everything. So um, in this case, when they did this, um, so here, you know, and this may, may be the case, but this, this was, I think, the initial ter interpretation. There's a, a foundation here, 17th century, another foundation here. This is a 1735 edition, which I already knew about. Um, there's another foundation from the 1740s, another uh, feature from the 1750s, 18th century, and so on. So you, by recording this and by understanding, uh, you know, using artifacts and other things to help date these features, you can really understand how the site uh, formed through uh, or changed through time, which is what we're trying to get to with uh, understanding how it may have changed during uh, the time of slavery and then afterwards. Okay? That makes sense? All right. And so that's the way to really do it. That's the way you really understand. Now, after Paul was, was uh, excavating there, there was some excavations that were not systematic. So, and the problem is, um, so you've got all this, you can see these layers here, right? So there's a very dark layer down here. There's a lighter layer here. All these layers mean something. So this may be, this may be, uh, you know, mid 19th century. This may be, you know, so maybe they had to infill this area. But this is a cellar hole from the uh, mid 17th century. But if you just go and you get all the artifacts from it, you know it's 17th century. But if you don't actually excavate things stratigraphically, you really don't understand what you have. So unfortunately, uh, there was some of that. Um, here's another feature that was excavated at that time. It's a stone line privy. Um, we know roughly the date because we have some of the artifacts from that. Um, and you can see some of them here. But, uh, but the point is you really want to record these things carefully so you understand the sequence of events. Okay? And uh, so that's, that was, uh, those are two of the excavations. And a third excavation across the road um, was the African uh, burial ground, and I don't, let me see a show of hands who, who knows about that. A lot of people, right? Okay, good. So um, this was uh, conducted because there was, they were going to put a sewer line in. And even though you have, even though you have, uh, you know, driveways and you have uh, roads and stuff, I guarantee there are things underneath this road and this driveway. Uh, Nothing, you know, these, these things of rows and things don't always destroy everything. So they dug right in this area here, right across from the flats, to put in a sewer line, and they found uh, 14 individuals of African descent. Uh, some had Native American line lineage as well, but this is a slave graveyard. Um, and it's fairly small, uh, 14 individuals, but you're only talking about a very small place. So there are probably other graves beyond this little, uh, this little corridor. So... Uh, they hired a contract firm, they came in, they identified the graves. Um, Lisa Anderson at the New York State Museum helped. They were able to um, uh, excavate the, the grave site and then reinter these individuals as they should have been um, just recently.
So this is all part of the overall landscape. If you look at um, you know, the flats here, you have this is where the building, uh, the Schuyler House is. This is where those, those uh, farm buildings I told you would have been. This is the burial ground. And then there's another site over here, uh, which is probably the, the, uh, the spot of uh, Chalk's house, which I'll talk about in a minute. OK, so those are the three excavations that were done. Uh, so what we want to do, try to add to that. Um, and the first thing we did was we did geophysical survey. So you heard of ground penetrating radar and uh, other methods. So that one of the things we use is ground penetrating radar. We use magnetometer to try to figure out what was below the ground. So we had some idea of, of where to dig. Uh, this is a magnetometer survey uh, printout. This is where the house was right here. You can see this right here. This is, a, um, this is a pipeline coming through here. This is a water line, I believe. You can see a, a T off that water line there. So you pick up these. You always pick up pipes. There's a, um, a fence line here. Often you find uh, metal fence lines because They'll sink them into concrete, and then when they decide they don't want the fence anymore, they'll just cut them off. So you pick them up on the magnetometer. Anything that's magnetic. The other thing that it picks up, so it picks up nails and things like that. This is a big conglomeration of metal, so is this with the house. But then you also pick out darker things. You see this right here. Um, it's mostly dark. It doesn't have this, this black and white, uh, like a positive and a negative charge. So this is the kind of stuff that you see that maybe there's something that's burned. So, and I'll particularly point out this one right here. Can you guys see that, how it's really dark right there? Um, so that was an area we wanted to see. Maybe it was a burn pit or something. Um, so we want to identify. Now, now, the main reason for doing this was to identify, you know, if we could find buildings, uh, any kinds of features that would be related to uh, really the whole history of the, the flats. But we want to just go down and try to figure out what they were and leave them in place. This is our... Um, so this is a uh, GPR readout, ground penetrating radar, and this is a smaller area, but you can see the house right here. This is probably part of a cellar hole. We thought maybe these were structures because uh, they really go down about six feet. So it really looked good for a cellar hole. You can see how that's nice and square, uh, that dark area. Uh, you can actually even see the path coming around here. So um, we were excited about that, uh, but then we have to test them, right? <laughs> you have to put a unit in. Uh, an excavation unit and try to see what you have before you get too excited. So one of the things we had here, I remember I showed you a dark area toward the, the bottom of the screen. That's this right here. Um, as it turns out, this is about maybe this deep, okay? And this is something that we knew it was either metallic or it was um, a burned area. And as it turns out, we got down, you know, a foot and a half. And we found this nice dark area right here. This is uh, subsoil here. This is where you see that trowel. That um, that's, looks like it's full of, not full of cultural debris, but it's, at least it's something that's been disturbed. And then you have this dark soil here. Well, right in this dark soil, there was a, there was a bottle base. And, a, and it looked like it was a dark like green bottle. But then once we, we you know, it, since it was right, right, it was embedded in that, uh, surface, and we wanted to try to get an idea of how old this was. We took it out, and it's like 1950s. <laughs> so, so what this tells us, like in this area, we know this area has been highly disturbed. This, you can see where it says CC here. This is where Paul Huey was digging in, in the 1970s. He found some intact um, possible posts, but definitely intact material over here. But then they came in, and they all this material, I think this is all... Uh, just modern debris. They came in with a bulldozer and dug a bunch of this stuff up, and I think that's what we're seeing here. This is really, unfortunately, this is really a disturbance, which is a lot of what we found. I mean, that's, that's what you find sometimes, right? Same with this thing. We thought, okay, well, this looks nice and deep, and you can see, right, see this line? Can everybody see that? There's like, a, there's, this is a little bit, I uh, can tell which is darker, which is, this is supposed to be darker, but this is definitely a different soil than this. So you have, anytime when you're doing archaeology, you look for differences in soil, and the difference in the color can sometimes tell you what's there, uh, that there's, you know, that there's a, a post or something. And in this case, this was right, we put this right over top of this, like right on the edge, and it, boom, it's right there. And then we decided, since we were finding mostly 20th century material, we decided, well, let's just go down about 10 cents. We usually like to expose everything first before you go into it. But we decided to go ahead and, and take 10 centimeters out of here. 
uh, just to see. And it's good that we did. This is, you can see the, uh, this is a, a kind of a hard packed gravel uh, layer. And then this cuts right through it. In other words, this, this surface was here first and this cuts through it. Okay, so we know that this is later. And this piece right here, which you can't really see, that's plastic. It's a big piece of like plastic, you know, sheathing or something. Uh, I think the jury's still out on what this is, but we didn't, we didn't bother to go any further with it because it's really definitely the top part of it is, is late. So it looks like something that somebody dug down in there fairly late. Um, so that one, that was kind of a bust as well. Um, although what it's doing is it's telling us which areas are, are disturbed and which aren't. So what I'll show you in a minute is how we're trying to put all this information together, including the, the information we have from, uh, from Paul. So in this particular case, we have this, um, and I showed you this earlier where we have these, um, we have these dark stains that show up in the magnetometer that don't really look like metal. And in this case, they're, they're most definitely not. And it just so happens that they're, uh, they show up about seven, I think six to seven feet apart. So there's, you can really see a linear thing going on here. Um, so we decided to test one of these and we came down onto this right here. This is a, it's a fire cracked rock feature. So it's probably a prehistoric uh, cooking hearth or at least part of one. Um, I think there's another picture here that shows a little bit better. Um, so you can see right here. So we're only, uh, this is what you would normally find if you had a plow zone. It's only about maybe uh, half a foot or three quarters of a foot down. And then you're right into something that's intact. So I don't know how old this is. Um, this, this is actually a biface or a, um, you know, some sort of a cutting tool uh, made out of chert that was found. Uh, this is the only tool we found. It was found in one of the other units. It wasn't right here. But we did find some tool stone, some uh, uh, flakes in this unit. I think four or five flakes in here. There was some charcoal embedded in this feature. So it's an intact uh, prehistoric feature. And then we, uh, so we, we uh, recorded it, mapped it in, and covered it up with dirt. So we know that there is preservation there. Um, there's good preservation in some areas and very poor preservation in others. Um, so what we're trying to do with this, you know, part of this is a management plan that we're gonna, uh, we're gonna give to the town of Colony uh, once we get done with all, everything and, and probably coupled with what Paul is doing. Um, and so you have the, this is an aerial view, so you have Paul's excavation here um, and then, so we have all this stuff uploaded into our GIS system. So these are the digs I showed you before in the, um, from, the 19, or from the 1970s through about 2000. Uh, so this is that big cellar hole I showed you that they dug through. That's about right in this area. Uh, there's some other features in here, so we've kind of mapped those in. There's that big uh, um, cobblestone feature. And then this is our survey. So you can see this line of uh, post right here, right next to the road. So that makes sense, there's a road. You can see a lot of features out in here as well. And one of the things I wanted to point out is, it, it just so happens that, see where we found this? Remember I told you guys where it looks like there was a bulldozer that came through there? <laughs> if you go back, let me go back here and I'll show you something. I just noticed this. See this right here? It just so happens to be about that width. And so that's right exactly where this is. So I think that's probably some, si some sort of disturbance. And here again, this whole area looks like it's really disturbed. Uh, so that's some, sometimes what you find. Uh, so this is a composite view. This is, uh, uh, this is Jim Bradley's uh, interpretation of what the Van Curler house might have looked like with the cellar hole. This is how it would have sat on the landscape. This is that uh, uh, feature that was dug by avocational uh, archaeologist or somebody who came in and, and dug there and then there's um, this is possibly uh, it's a little bit off actually but there might be a an earlier structure in here um, and then you've got this really dark area here which may still be an intact cellar um, it looks really good for that but then here are other features so um, what we're trying to do is this composite view and try to really understand the totality of what's going on there that makes sense okay um, the other thing is we're trying to understand the larger, um, the larger uh, landscape, of course, of, of, um, of which uh, Schuyler Flats fits into. One of the places I had mentioned this chalk. Uh, chalk was actually a, um, 
uh, the son of one of the Schuylers and one of the uh, uh, slaves at the, um, at the Schuyler residence. So this is a, an account of it in Anne, um, Anne Grant's memoir. Uh, Chalk was given, a, Chalk Schuyler was given a, um, uh, a parcel of land about two miles from the, the house back in the woods. And we think that it's right here because we have meets and bounds records that tell us. Uh, so it's within this point right here, it's within about 150 feet from this. So it's, it's right in this area somewhere. Right now, this area has been developed. Um, and so it may be on the other side of it, there's an area that hasn't been developed. So we have an idea of maybe where his house is. It'd be nice to, um, to try to confirm that because it is, it is in private, uh, on private land right now and it's threatened uh, if somebody ever wants to do something to develop that. Uh, the other thing, of course, we're looking at uh, is the neighborhood. As I mentioned before, you know, you have, in this case, you've got Schuyler, um, uh, Schuyler Flats is right here. So you've got nine, this is from, uh, I think, I think this is from the 1790 census. So you've got nine slaves living here, eight slaves, five slaves, nine slaves at this uh, Abraham Curler. So there's, there's kind of a neighborhood, and you see this within the, slave, within the census records. If you use them as spatial data, you start seeing these little ne neighborhoods um, where these larger estates were. And then how does that translate to emancipation? Do communities form? Do African-American communities form after? Uh, it's one of the things that we're interested in. So I just want to point out um, a little bit of what I know so far from um, uh, the area around uh, the flats and then Cohoes, the other area we're working in. Uh, these are some individuals here. So John Waters, uh, Walters, um, and then Anthony Walters before him. Uh, William Adams, these were two uh, farmers that owned um, the uh, uh, island of Vance Kike, Vance Kike Island. Stephen Schuyler down here at the flats. And then these individuals here are African Americans who were um, these family names, uh, especially Thompson and Jackson, are very prominent not just in Waterbelit but also in, in Bethlehem. Uh, so these are families that were, uh, that their members were enslaved, then they, they tried to make a living in terms of uh, farming. And we know from, um, one of the things from Ann Grant's book is that she talks about how um, these uh, individuals were, some of the, the slaves were, had these small gardens where they were selling some of the produce and they were exchanging some of the produce with their, um, uh, with their kin. So they were obviously farmers, right? And so these are Thomas Powell, Albert Thompson, Jeremiah Thompson, John Jackson. We know where these individuals were living, okay? So we know that on the landscape. There are a few other, other families I'm still trying to work out. Um, so how are they, how do they compare, of course, and this is, as you can imagine, right? So this is overall farm value. Uh, these are the Thompson, the Jackson, and the Thomas Powell. Uh, they have very small farms between, uh, I think all these fam, well, Thomas Powell had 12 uh, acres at this time. So this is 1850, and then he advanced it to four, 40 acres or so. Uh, these other families, between two and five acres. Uh, of course, the Schuylers had larger, larger um, estates. And then Cohoes, of course, these are 165 acres or so each. So you get some idea of the, you know, the scale here. But then if you look at how are they using this, these, uh, um, these small farms, what's the output here? So if you look at a guy like John Jackson, their family, uh, this is in terms of output per acre. So you know, this is potatoes. This red line here is potatoes. So in terms of uh, output per acre, these guys are outpacing uh, the Schuylers and John Waters, uh, Walters, um, uh, Cahos, uh, because they were making more, more use of each, every inch of, of agricultural land that they could. Um, so they were e sort of eking out a, an existence. And I imagine a lot of their economy was also barter. Um, Here's Thomas Powell, just to look at one individual. Thomas Powell and his son, uh, Paul Powell, were farmers from uh, 1818. Uh, Thomas Powell bought uh, 12 acres in 1818. And then, as I said, he, he, uh, he eventually had 50 acres. Um, and his son, uh, Paul, was a farmer as well. But after, 
about, so he dies sometime between 17, or between 1880 and 1900, but he was still farming in 1880. So you have this fairly long period of, of farming, and then, then these families just vanish after 1900. But you can see here, that here's the average for um, that size of a farm for about 12 acres in blue, and then Tom, where Thomas Powell is here, and he's really, he's really doing fairly well in terms of, of his size of farm. But the one thing you see outside of Powell, if you look at these other families, the, the value of their farms for the, for the size of the farm, between one and four acres uh, per acre, they have a much smaller evaluation for their land. So maybe they're living on, on uh, you know, the worst land in the county or something, I don't know. Uh, I'm still trying to work all this out, but this is, this is part of the problem. This is part of, part of the question, right? Um, it's not just about slavery, it's what happens after slavery and trying to understand uh, how people are, are trying to, how people are making it. Um, so the second site, I want to talk about Nichols Still House. This is located down in um, Bethlehem, uh, just uh, south of the Vloman's Kill. Does anyone know where um, Henry Hudson Park is? It's just, okay, so it's just on the other side, just to the south of Henry Hudson Park. Uh, so it's about eight, I guess seven or eight miles south, or maybe, maybe not quite that far from Albany, but it's a bit south. The only, um, there were a lot of buildings in Nickel Sill. Uh, this building here, uh, this is the other unusual thing. You have, I showed you those three buildings. I showed you the three buildings, Nickel Sill, Schuyler Flats, <laughs> and then uh, Van Skyke, and they all have a date of 1735. <laughs> so I'm like, there's obviously they're not they haven't been dated you can use dendrochronology or or um, tree ring dating to date buildings but but they haven't been dated so they're probably that date is probably just something that keeps being perpetuated um, there was an addition at Schuyler Flats in 1735 so maybe that maybe that date is coming from that structure I don't know um, but that's a that's a date that you see over and over again in fact the um, uh, the Sylvester Manor out on on uh, Long Island also has a date of 1735, so I'm not sure. Um, anyway, this building is still standing. This is the early part. You can see, and I'll show you in a minute the, the, how this dates, but this is the early one, early part. So this is 1730s probably. This is some, a later edition in the late 18th century, and th there's been a couple more editions. This is the only outbuilding that's standing right now, so that's a carriage house. So at Nickel Sill, um, it was the, uh, during the late 18th century, Nickel Sill was the largest slaveholding estate in Albany County. So 18 slaves is a very large estate for really anywhere in New York State. In, uh, in a place like Maryland or Virginia, this is nothing uh, in terms of numbers of enslaved people, but this would have been a large slaveholding uh, estate. Um, this individual right here, Caesar Nichols, was living on the, on the property. This is a very very um, famous daguerreotype of Caesar Nichols from uh, 1851 or 52, I believe. It's the, it's the year before he died. He was supposed to be 110 years old. <laughs> so I don't think that's right. I don't think he's 110 years old, but that's what they have in the census. So that's been perpetuated over the years. It's possible. Um, but it's a very famous picture. So he was living here at Nichols Cell. Uh, I put these runaway ads in it. Partly because of what I just said here. So this is from this one here is from 1690 or 1796, and this is Caesar was 28 years old. So there was a Caesar that living there. We know there was at least one younger Caesar that was born in 17 or in 1800. So maybe this was Caesar's son, or this could have been the Caesar that I just showed. It could have been his. This could actually have been him. Um, but you can get information from runaway ads. We have a couple here. There's some from Schuyler Flats as well. Um, this is a composition of nickel sill. Um, you can see in, this is after emancipation. So at the time, so you can see uh, 1830, 1840, um, there's still some African Americans who are living as laborers on the nickel sill um, uh, at the house. And then in 1850, uh, they're not. And then what you see in, in 1870 is you see a lot of domestic servants, but they're all Irish immigrant servants uh, here in the Nickel Sill House. So, and the reason I point this out is because of what we find in archaeology, so from 1830 to 1840. 
Um, this is the uh, this is a house. As I said, it's seen various uh, iterations. This is the first part of the house. You can see from 1730s or 1795, they put this addition on and uh, expand it quite a, a bit. And then in 1810, they put this uh, kitchen wing on, which they say was used also as a slave quarter. But if you remember, uh, after gradual emancipation, you know, uh, all of the slaves living at Nickel Sill were going to be free by the 1820s anyhow. So I think they probably did this because they had the labor to, to do it. Um, they, they advanced this kitchen wing. And then there's also a place they call the tea room, and then they put on the porches in the 1850s. So you can tell some of these changes, and you want to look at how the building changes, how the landscape changes, and take all these things into account. Okay, so here's Nickel Sill from the, from the air. These are all buildings here that no longer exist. So you've got all these, these uh, uh, blue uh, buildings here that we know. There are lots of outbuildings. Here's a carriage house that I mentioned before. This is the main house, and then this is an area that there was some previous archaeology done. So we want to try to figure out, like, we know that there were a lot of buildings in here but that were here in the, in the 19th century, but are they early 19th century? Do they relate to uh, the period of uh, slavery or after? So we want to date them. There was some, just like in, uh, at uh, the Flats, there was some uh, um, archaeology done here by avocationalists in the 1980s by the Bethlehem Archaeology Group. Unfortunately, here too, um, there's good uh, horizontal control. In other words, we know where they were digging, but, but we don't have very good vertical control. So we can't really see how things were changing through time based on these, these excavations. Um, and this is right behind the house. They found evidence of a, of a 17th century structure back in here. They found some um, possible uh, stones that were associated with a foundation and also some some early pipe stems and so on. Um, so this is on the, uh, this would be on the north side of the structure. So that would be on, not on this side, but on the other side, like over in here. So we wanted to find out, we wanted to see if we could figure out systematically how this, um, uh, you know, where some of these buildings I showed you before, where they were located. We did a, uh, this is a ground penetrating radar survey and you can see in here, you can see these, we know that this is a modern uh, irrigation pipe going out to this, uh, um, this garden here. But then there are also some of these uh, trenches in here that may line up with some of these buildings. Now this is uh, based on the, the recollections of somebody from the 1930s. This is where these buildings were located. So we've got some features in here we're going to go test. Um, we've, we've just scratched the surface on this. We really haven't tested all these features yet. This is a mag uh, survey. Um, magnetometer. You can see here's the house and you can see this old um, uh, drive that no longer exists. Sometimes these things pop out, sometimes they don't. Um, here again there's a lot of noise over in here. In other words there's a lot of metal or something going on over in this area. So there were, this is maybe evidence of those buildings. Um, and then some other linear things you kind of see in here. So we had some, and then of course right over here there's this really dark area. So we're interested in, in testing and finding out what these things are and what they date to. Um, this is just another stylized version. So what I'm going to show you is we're testing this area right here, this dark area um, right in here that looks like a burned area, and then uh, this area right over here that has a trench and another area that's possibly burned. Um, so we went out with our team and we did some small excavation units. Um, this is a 50 by 50 centimeter unit, it's fairly small. Um, this is right over in this area, and what we found here, you can, you can see I've drawn a little line in there, it doesn't actually, just to show you a little bit better, but there's a, there's a post in here, so there's a post hole that we found. It's probably 19th century, it's fairly large, so it could have been a um, support post for one of these outbuildings. Um, the artifacts coming from here are, are really exclusively uh, 1830s and, and later. So it's not something that's earlier, it's something that's it's a bit later. Um, there was also, I think what was setting off the magnetometer was not this, I think it was just fortunate that we found this, this uh, uh, post hole because uh, what was setting off the magnetometer was actually chicken wire. <laughs> so chicken wire, it doesn't look like normal metal because it's got a lot of holes in it. Uh, but sometimes that's what you find. But we decided to go ahead and take this down because we thought, well, maybe there was a fence along here. You can see the, 
it's, this lines up with the building. So maybe this is either it's part of a building that was along here or it's maybe part of that fence. I think this is earlier um, because of the way that the soil uh, looked when we went down. Another one we found was this another later feature. This is what happens sometimes. You, find, you don't know until you actually test them. This is a one by one meter unit that we dug and we really wanted to get an idea of the stratigraphy here so we, we dug it down. You can, can you guys see this, how it's darker right here? It's kind of a bowl shape. Um, okay, so if you can see that, it's just lighter color soil. Here again, you're looking for the differences in the soil colors. So anybody, if you, they know archaeology, this comes up pretty high, which means it's pretty late. So this is cutting down through this. And this turns out to, it was full of coal and, uh, you know, early 20th century burned uh, nails and wire nails and so on. So it's something that's late. I don't know what it is. It could have been a burn, burn barrel. Everybody remembers those, right? <laughs> I had one of those when I was a kid. So maybe it was something like that. I don't know. But within this, we got a really good sample of the artifacts. And I'll show you that in a minute of what was intact. And this really showed, this unit here, we also found, we never really uh, found the anomaly in here. I'm not really sure what happened with this one. But you can see this darker soil there. Can everybody see that? See at the top? See how it gets lighter? It's got a band of soil right in here. And then it's really got a, a really light band here. Um, and then, of course, down here would be the prehistoric. And oddly enough, um, just across the road from this, there's a site um, that uh, uh, was a Mohegan site. And uh, but, so I figured that we'd find a lot of historic, prehistoric material, and we really didn't, um, especially the intact material. We found maybe a, one or two pieces of pottery and a couple of flakes. Um, but this, this line right here, between here and there, this strata, as we call it in archaeology, uh, had domestic refuse in it, so domestic material uh, dating from the 1830s. So this is the type of artifacts that we found. It was almost all, was the stuff at the top in the dark layer was uh, 20th century. The stuff in this, this second strata, uh, it was consistently post-1830, maybe to 1850. So, but nothing really that you'd expect in the 1870s. So it's, it's really 1830s, 1850s material. Lots of, uh, you know, there's some pearl wear in there, but this, this classic, you know, post-1830s uh, light transfer print. There's some Rockingham, uh, stuff that you find in the 30s and 40s. So um, it's, it's too far from the house to be a, a, a refuse debris from the house unless they were dumping things over there. That's a possibility. Um, some other personal items, a few buckles. This is a buckle that needs conservation. Uh, part of a um, uh, part of a, an ear bob, probably from a, a piece of jewelry, uh, bone button, and some other other objects. But it all pretty pretty much fits within this uh, 1830s period. So it, there's there's really a strata there of, of material. Um, the other thing that we we tested was this darker area over here, um, and we actually put this down. It's a little deeper than we wanted to go, but it's. Uh, there's something in here that you can see there's some wood, there's a bucket down in here. Um, there's very few artifacts other than a lot of coal. Maybe there was a coal shed out in here. Um, the artifacts that we did find, datable artifacts, are 19th century. So early 19th century to maybe the 1840s or so. Really not enough artifacts to date this. So what we're going to do here is, it's just a very small unit that we dug, basically like a shovel test. Um, so what we want to do here is we want to come across and probably do a, a longer, you know, maybe this wide, but a couple of units coming down on top of this thing just to see how wide it is. And eventually what we want to do is we want to date it. Okay, we want to find out what it is, what it dates to. Same with these over here. So we got some other anomalies we want to, we want to test um, just to try to, I think we're, this over here, we may have one or two more. We want to, you know, try to piece this together. We've got a long ways to go at Nickel Sill, I think, but um, the main thing here is we want to do controlled excavations and preservation as much as possible. We want to find out as much as we can with digging as little as possible. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk to you guys about is this idea of community formation. Now, in Bethlehem, this is an idea I showed you. Uh, this, uh, I sh or I talked about the, um, uh, in the uh, census, how you see all these, these slaveholding plant, uh, estates are close to these large slaveholding estates, usually cluster together because they're, they're close to, you know, uh, good farmland and so on. 
And so you see an extension of this. Um, this is actually from Columbia County. I just pulled a piece of data off there. Um, but then you see, so this is 1830. So then you start seeing, this is that, so this is, you know, when emancipation is, is starting, you're starting to see some of these families are freed. Uh, you see these individuals are staying around, maybe this is the area, maybe this is the state where they were living and so on. So trying to follow this pattern. This is from, so this is Bethlehem uh, again, and this is from 1830. So you see all these individuals, the reason there are no numbers here is these are all uh, free people of color, so that you don't see that on here. Um, but these are all families. So these are the families you see down there, the Knott family, uh, and some of these are the same surnames you'll see with, uh, um, with the planters, uh, the Whitback, um, there's uh, Jackson, the Jackson family. These are the Thompson family. There's probably a Thompson on here. Um, but they're all in one place. So these, these uh, individuals, I think right after emancipation, they're, they're all kind of congregated in the same place. And I'll show, that in a, show you that in a second. So these are some of the individuals that we know were at, at uh, Nickel Sill, uh, Rosa Jackson, Thomas Thompson, John Knott was living there. So the Knott family. Um, and, and a couple of others. So this is really an interesting thing that I found was that uh, between 40 and 70 percent of the, the entire African-American population uh, within uh, Bethlehem was living within two miles of Nickel Sill. Okay, so you start to see these, uh, you start to see these little areas um, uh, form as neighborhoods. Um, so this is, you don't really see this in water, but at least I, can, I can, haven't seen it yet. Um, but in, in Bethlehem, you do. This is another way of looking at that. So you have this little area down, right? So you have this, this area here. This is within two miles. These, these uh, circles here are, are um, where the really neighborhoods are forming. And so really what you want to look at is this, this yellow. This is a percentage. So this is, you can see in 1850 and 1860, most... Um, African Americans are living in right down by uh, Nickel Sill. Okay. Now, of course, there's still a very small uh, percentage of the population, the overall population, but you really see a pattern here. Um, so these are some of the surnames that you see. This area right here is especially uh, uh, the Jackson family buys a piece of property there, seven acres, and then uh, uh, various families come in and out. Of course, when a when a uh, the husband will die or or the wife will die and some elderly, you know, people get elderly, you see them showing up in these various households. So you'll see the, the Jacksons taking in Thompson family, the Thompson, the Hollands are all, uh, um, they're intermarrying. So you see a lot of these families are very, very tied by kin and by geographic distance. Um, so that's really interesting. There's, there's some areas down here that are a possibility for, for excavation as well. And that's really what you want to get to, right? You want to figure out, well, how are these families, um, how are they um, uh, getting on in the, 19th, or in the 19th century after emancipation? How are they uh, injecting themselves into the, uh, the marketplace and so on? So the final site we're working on is Van Skyke Mansion. Um, Van Skyke, it's, it's very similar to, to Schuyler Flats in Bethlehem, or, and uh, Nichols Hill. Van Skyke, uh, here again, the 1730s building, right? Um, there was some previous archaeology done there, so the, the house I just showed you is right here. There were some excavations that were done by Hartkin Associates. They, didn't, they found some buried deposits down in this area, lots of 19th century artifacts, um, but some in really interesting stratigraphy down in here, um, and then uh, lots of artifacts over in this area, not so much over in there. So um, we wanted to go in and do the same thing as we did at Schuyler Flat, Flats in Bethlehem. We did a geophysical survey. Uh, this is Tim Horsley from, uh, uh, he's from Northern Illinois. He's a geophysicist that also does archaeology. He came out and he did a, he's doing the magnetometer here. And then this is a, a, a technique called, mag, uh, called uh, resistivity, soil resistivity. Uh, and then we also did GPR. So he did the, he did the graveyard as well, um, the family graveyard. So this is just a few preliminary printouts that I have from Tim. 
Uh, you can see like here, obviously the lane coming in here, but you can also see, can you guys see there's like a square right there? Okay, that was one of the things we picked up in, in the, uh, this is the GPR, but we also picked it up in the magnetometer. Um, and then this area, it's kind of dark. This is the GPR. You don't see it so much here, but this is farther down. That's, that's about 35, 35 to 40 centimeters, I guess it says. Um, so there's a really dark area there. The, the um, uh, Harkins excavations are right up in here. So they were kind of coming across this. So I have to go back and look at their, their excavations to see what they actually came up with there. But there's definitely, you see how this is kind of, uh, I would say it's kind of bubbly there. It doesn't look like it's, uh, there's a lot of noise there. It's not all this bright, uh, anytime you see this black and white, that's definitely metal here. But there's just a lot, you see it's really bumpy right there. And see how it's totally clean right here? Does that make sense, guys? Like this area is really smooth. This area is really bumpy. So there's something going on here. There's, maybe there's a building down in there. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a couple of test units down in here. We're going to put a test unit over here. We think this is where the garden was. I don't know if that was, that's what it makes sense as, because it's really, you, you know, it's not a building. You'd see a lot more metal. So you, right here, you can see that square. It's probably a garden. Maybe it's a 20th century garden, but it could be an earlier garden. Um, but we're planning on doing a, maybe a couple of uh, test units right on the edge. Um, and then there's an area over here. We're probably going to put a test unit in here, but this, this is right on the hillside, and it may be from trash that has, has been uh, pushed down against the edge. It's hard to tell. It, it looks like it might be a fence line. Um, we're going to put a unit in there um, as well just to see what we have. But, uh, and then in the future, maybe put a, put a unit on the inside of, of this addition right here that was probably put on in the 1830s. Um, and then the last thing I want to leave, leave you with, this is the view across the road from, from Van Skyke. So this is, this is a, uh, they put in this building, I think, probably about a year ago or maybe, maybe two years ago. And then this is, is being built up. We came out, the first time we came out to do the survey, um, there was, it was treed like this. And the next time we came out, it looked like this. So they really, they really kind of wiped this whole landscape clean. They did a survey there, but they did a 50 by 50 foot survey of, with these little shovel tests. And sometimes you don't find everything in those surveys. Uh, so I'm, you know, I just want to put it up there because this is what we have to have to uh, deal with, um, especially the sites that aren't protected. So sites that are on private property, um, we're going to start to uh, work more toward that because, you know, this is what's happening. What do you mean by a shovel test? Oh, I'm sorry. So a shovel test is just, it's just what you think of. It's just a shovel test, shovel hole that you dig like every 25 or every 50 feet. Oh. And so let's say you find a uh, a big pile of brick in this one and then you go 50 feet that way and you find a smaller pile and so on. It can tell you, okay, well most of the materials over here or most of your artifacts are in this area. So it gives you an idea of where, where, to, uh, where sites are located and where to dig. Now we use, uh, we use geophysical survey and I think that's a good, if you've got the money to do it, um, it's good to do geophysical survey if you can because it's a not, totally non-invasive uh, technique. So. Um, anyway, that's all I have, but if you have any questions... I, I... Nicholson.